I'm John Golia. And I'm Greg Fife. And we are the, the Flight Safety, Safety Detectives. Detectives. We're just two guys who have spent most of their career with the National Transportation Safety Board investigating aircraft disasters and aviation safety issues all over the world. Yep, and this podcast is where we talk about everything from accidents, airplane technology, to the big business of aviation. We live and breathe aviation. My co-host, John, has been in the aviation business for more than 60 years. He was the first and only airframe and power plant mechanic to get a presidential appointment to the National Transportation Safety Board. And Greg is a former air safety investigator and go team captain for the NTSB. He's investigated everything that flies worldwide since he started his career 40 years ago. And on top of that, he is a living legend of aviation inductee. So between John and myself, we have over 100 years of aviation safety experience. It's time to buckle up because it's going to be wheels up. Let's get this show in the air. Well, hello, everybody. This is John Golier. I'm here again with Greg Fife. And we're here today to talk about some brand new technology that has the ability to be a game changer for the environment as far as aircraft are performed in the area of efficiency, either more efficiency on flying or flying greater distances on less fuel. So we're here today with a company called Tamarack. They have designed and built a a little different version of a wingtip. We have two of their engineers present in the studio. One is Nick Guida, and the other is Jacob Killingsmith, and both of which we're going to talk about their technology, what it means for aviation, and what it means uh, uh, for both the pilots and the maintenance community. So welcome, gentlemen. Thanks. Thanks for having us. Good to be here. And I'll say my welcome as well. I'm unfortunately in Tampa, Florida, displaced once again. John and I are still on our traveling road show, so... I appreciate you guys coming into the studio so that we can uh, we can talk about the uh, active wing technology. And um, you know, when we talk about active winglets, a lot of the uh, the pilots and a lot of the listeners who are aviation oriented understand what winglets are because every time they're on a commercial airliner, they look out the window and we got a bunch of bent wing tips out there. And so they're at least probably understanding of that technology. They know that it supposedly increases fuel efficiency and things like that. But your technology is different. It's called active winglet technology. Give me an understanding, Nick or Jacob, with regard to what makes it so different. When you look at a brand new airplane like a a 777X or the Airbus A350 or the 787, you have that smooth wing technology that has a raked wing tip. So it's a continuous wing all the way out. It looks more like a gull wing than anything else. Can you just explain to the folks listening so that they get an understanding of what the concept is behind active winglet technology? Yeah, so this is Nick. The whole idea is that we have this technology and because of the way we've designed it, we are alleviating load that an additional extension or winglet produces when it's stuck onto a a wing. We can triple or quadruple the efficiency of a typical passive winglet because we have this active element that's a load alleviating device. So, you know, winglets have been around literally over a hundred years. I mean, the, the patent, first patent was 1897. And I have pictures from 1910 with biplanes and monoplanes flying with winglets. That's nothing new. The split winglets came in the 70s with NASA, did some research. And, you know, winglets have been around a long time. MD-11 had a split winglet, right? So, and load alleviation has been around since the L-1011 has been around. What I did was, I'm I'm the inventor and the, the founder of the company. I'm an aerospace engineer. And I was a DER for years. And I was doing work for companies that wanted to put winglets on airplanes, like King Airs, for instance. But when you do the analysis, you always have to reinforce the wing. Your fatigue life is always suffering. You end up with these challenges of putting a winglet on, and then you detract from the benefit because of the additional weight. Like a 737, it's almost 500 pounds of weight. It's almost 2,000 pounds for a 767 to put winglets on it because you're reinforcing the wing. Picture if you, if you extend a wing or put a winglet on an airplane, it redistributes the load, the spanwise distribution, Picture carrying three logs to the fireplace. If you carry them close to your body, your arms don't 
have as much load on them. But if you extend your arms, you're going to have the same load produces a lot more harmful effects on your shoulders and it's harder to carry. That's what the same exact thing happens with winglets. So then I had this epiphany on the way back from a Steely Dan concert back in 2009 (laughs) in, in Seattle. And I said, there has to be a way to turn the winglet off during the high G event, right? Because wings aren't designed for 1G. They're designed for 5 or 4, 6 Gs, right? So during those events, during a high G load maneuver or a gust, let's aerodynamically disengage the winglet by deflecting this small, looks like a little aileron. It deflects up or down depending on if the G load is positive or negative. And it aerodynamically disengages the winglet for a fraction of a second or however long it needs to, to put the bending moment and the stress on the wing back to baseline or lower. And it's so efficient on the CJ line, the Citation Jet, that we actually increase the max zero fuel weight 400 pounds because the bending moments are lower. Fatigue life is the same or better. And the additional wing span creates a different wing loading. So now you can climb better. Single engine climb performance is incredible. You can get to 41,000 feet with these little CJs immediately right off the bat, even at hot temperatures and high weights. So it, it completely changes the way these airplanes fly. And I'm talking too much right now, but you get the idea. It's, that's what makes us different. We have this active element. We extend the wing and put a winglet, not just put a winglet, like the typical passive winglets. What makes that winglet intuitive? Are there sensors? I mean, how does, how does that winglet know when to reduce the loads? Yeah, so the, the main idea is that the wing is feeling stress when the fuselage is feeling G's, essentially. So we're sensing G's. We've got inputs for other parameters too, but primarily it's sensing G's. So it's on a predictive schedule. And so it's deploying the surfaces to alleviate that load based on the NZ schedule. It's in position, has capability of being in position in a tenth of a second. So it's very fast and, like I said, predictive. So it can um, be responsive to a gust or a maneuver. Jason, for our guest, explain what you mean by predictive. If you're entering a, a gust event, it's actually sensing the NZ, the vertical acceleration on the aircraft, and it's, it's anticipating what that event's going to look like based on scientific data. Right, so on data or assumptions made on the part of, the, of you, the programmer of the system? On data. On data, yeah. okay. And when you when you look at this technology, I know that your your epiphany was probably induced by a lot of things from that concert. Yeah. Why is this technology just coming to light now? Given all of the technology that evolved through NASA flight tests and and of course, you know, the civilian airliners like you were talking about. Has yeah. this concept been thought of before and somebody just poo-pooed it, didn't decide to carry through with it, or what changed? Well, that's always the typical question, Greg, because, I mean, we got the patent in 2011. So I started the company in 2010. Yeah, and when you're doing it, you're thinking, how, how come someone hasn't already thought of this? I don't know. I mean, the, the, may, maybe the fact that I was a DER in loads, fatigue, structures, and I'm a pilot, you know, I fly these jets. And so all these different things, it, it came together. And, and maybe I've been, t- someone has said, uh, he theorized that the silo idea of an airplane company keeps the crosstalk down so that you don't come up with a solution like this. I don't know. I mean, I, I took me, it took, I was a DER for 15 years before I came up with it. And you were working on traditional passive winglet modifications. So you understood the connection between right. trying to put a winglet on an airplane to get the efficiency detuning, aerodynamically detuning the winglet so that you could handle it from a stress standpoint. And then it was kind of those two things working together from you having that experience to be able to say, oh, what if we combine something that's existing, which is load alleviation since L1011, like you said, and the winglet without having to aerodynamically detune the winglet, we can optimize what's best for the airplane operationally and performance wise without the structural compromise. I don't know how to answer that, Greg. If, if you think about, if you think about why Boeing or why Airbus or anybody haven't done this, I draw a blank. There's a lot of smart guys, and I'm not smarter than anybody. These guys, a lot, a lot of times, these guys are much more educated and intelligent than I am. But I just, you know, that's how these ideas work. Something happens. Well, that, that's because they didn't go to that Steely Dan concert. Could be. Oh. <laughs> 
<laughs> they served those special um, mushrooms there? They had, well, <laughs> a couple of questions on what you said. Adding the 500 pounds, it was, I know it was just an example, and the wingtip. How much of an extension of a wingtip on the C, CJ products did this system require? So for the CJ, we add about 70 pounds. So we add, we add an extension, and then we have a winglet. So we extend the wing two and a half feet each side, and then we put a winglet. So all that is about 70 pounds. And we have the brains and the boxes and the in, in routing wiring. But the key is that there's no structural reinforcements along the wing. We, it only takes us a week to put these on, because, and that some of that's paint. Because we only go into the wing about the, the, the last six inches of the wingtip. That's how non-evasive this system is. If you know about, like, Citation 10 winglets or other Falcon winglets, you know, you're, you're putting modifications on ailerons and slats and, and the outboard section of the wing, and you're taking the skin panels off and putting stringers in. It's a big deal. That's what kind of forced me to say, hey, there has to be a solution. Essentially, because you're unloading the wingtip at times of flight, when it's really not needed, and you're unloading it so it's just going along for the ride. Okay. You don't have to reinforce the wing to then take up for those unnecessary loads that would have been generated. That's right. And a good passive winglet makes all that worse. If you make a good design, a good passive wing, and anytime you hit a G, the stresses are a lot higher than they would have been without that winglet. That's the downside, the structural downside of the winglet. So, yes, a, a, a gust on a plane like a CJ the gust happens in 342 milliseconds. So you don't care about efficiency for uh, an event that is less than a second. So for a fraction of a second, your winglet's turned off, you lose that efficiency, but who cares? Because what you're trying to do is not shake everybody inside to death, right? And then on top of that, like a maneuver, if you're trying to avoid another plane up at altitude and you're pulling, like these CJs are about 3.6 Gs. If you're trying to pull three Gs to get away from another plane, you don't care about efficiency for the, the 10 second duration, right? So this is the, the point of that's what the epiphany was, was the wings aren't designed for 1G, they're designed for 5. So turn anything off about 1.5, just turn off the winglets. We don't need them. You talk about the performance of the wing and the loads. And just for those people, because we do have listeners who are aeronautically inclined, but they may not be pilots. When we're talking about loads, we're talking about aerodynamic loads not a weight load, if you will, on, on yeah. the wing and the wing structure. We're talking aerodynamic loads, correct? Yeah, aerodynamic loads. The spanwise distribution of the lift creates an internal stress. So these, those are external loads. Aerodynamic loads are called external loads, and they create internal loads in the structure through means of stress and deformation and things like that. So, yes, the external loads look- create inter- higher internal stresses. So we have a device that turns off the aerodynamic load, which results in lower internal stresses on the wing. When we talk about, you know, like the CJ, that's considered to be a stiff wing airplane. Unlike a, a commercial airliner that's got that long wing that, that <laughs> I won't say it flaps up and down, but it does move a lot, especially on a 787 or a 777 or Airbus or whatever, where when you finally load the airplane in, in flight, that wing has, is basically flexing up six, seven, ten feet. These airplanes Even more. are stiff wing airplanes. A lot of a lot of the regional jets are stiff wing airplanes. With your technology, does that dampen the loads to make the ride a little smoother in turbulence? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, we see that. We've actually measured that on the CJs, and a lot of our customers, companions, have even noticed it without it being a discussion beforehand. They're like, "Wow, this is a lot smoother with these winglets on here." So yeah, for sure. Well, you meant you know the, that, the seven eight seven has a ride comfort kind of feature, right? That uses the same thing. It kind of damp it damps it out in order to make the the customers feel better. Yeah. So our, we have an element that that does that even for a little TJ. Nav exterior light, servo control, Nine. engine start panel, crank it aboard. When we talk about increased performance for, you know, I know that the winglets themselves give the airplane better hot high performance which that means is you're operating from a high altitude airport like in denver or something on a hot day of course aircraft performance across the board decreases because of the higher altitude and the higher temperatures airplanes like lower altitudes and lower temperatures for uh, aerodynamic efficiency so how does the winglet improve that kind of performance under those conditions well 
The simple answer is incredibly. So remember that winglets and then wing extensions, all those those types of aerodynamic modifications reduce the induced drag. They actually create a higher form drag, but we know drag is con consists of form and induced drag and some other type, types of drags, but those are the main two. So induced drag is when your lift coefficient is high, meaning you're flying slowly and you have a heavy airplane or like a high altitude, you have these lift coefficients. The lift coefficient is high, the aspect ratio is in the bottom of that equation and it makes the induced drag much lower. So that's the crux of why this is happening. So the practical side of that is if you fly out of Telluride, you can put somewhere between 500 and 1,000 pounds, depending on if you're flap 15 or flap zero, if you have the runway length, you can take between five and 1,000 pounds more to make your single engine gradients. If the, if the listeners don't know that, but if you lose an engine when you're taking off, you have to still be able to climb. And the FAA prescribes very specific climb gradients that are required. And if you, so, so winglets increase that anywhere between 18 and 25% when, with the CJs, which <clears throat> translates to having hundreds of pounds more. So in the old days, before winglets, you'd have to leave at 3 o'clock in the morning when it's cold, or you'd have to kick off your golf clubs or your mother-in-law or whatever before you could take off. So this was, this was always um, a problem with high, hot altitudes. But, and, and that also translates to getting to altitude. So, you know, at 41,000 feet, these planes now in 30 minutes can get to 41,000 feet. And so it's all about climbing. It's all about high lift coefficients. And then once it gets up there, the plane can accelerate. So we can carry more fuel, more people out of higher and hot conditions. This is why the military is so excited about what we're doing, because they fly high and hot all the time. And sometimes these planes are grounded because they'll have a 3.3% gradient that the military has for IMC conditions, and the planes are grounded. They can't take off. So with our winglets, we can get these guys to fly m hours longer, or no, hours. Instead of zero hours, it's infinity better, right? Because it's five or six hours instead of being grounded. So all, the single-engine climb is huge. And I know that John's going to have questions about the maintenance aspect and, and that kind of thing. But the one last question I have, and that is with this technology, when we're looking at the, the winglet itself, is there anything that a pilot must do differently, either during a pre-flight or in flight, to monitor the performance of these winglets? Is there a way to monitor it, or is it just reside in the background, it's doing its thing, and um, the pilot is really passively involved with the operation of these winglets? For the most part, it's very transparent to the pilot. So, you know, it's a dark cockpit philosophy. There is an enunciator for if there's a, a problem with the active winglets, but it's doing a health check when it powers up. And when the enunciation is black, it's all good to go. Uh, like I said, it's, it's responding very quickly. Uh, so there's nothing really for the pilot to do uh, except for to enjoy the benefits. But if there is a problem, then the, the red light would come on and you would slow down just like if you had an inadvertent flap deployment or something like that. You just slow down to protect the structure. And we do have dispatch with known failures that is part of the um, certification. But, you know, th it's a reliable system. And as long as that black cockpit is in place, then you're good to go. And what puts that light on? The system has its own health check. And so it's doing, um, like I said, on, on a power up, it's doing that health check. And it's monitoring things like power uh, availability, uh, volts and amps, uh, symmetry between the surfaces. They operate together. Uh, so maintaining that symmetry performance, if you're going through some sort of an, uh, maneuver or a gust, it's actually doing monitor for its own performance. And if any, if any of that criteria is broken, then it'll throw a fault. Well, so that's on startup. What about in flight? No, that's in flight. Oh, that's in flight. It does its own bit when you start up. And then before you take off, you push the button three times to do another bit. So that's, uh, that is all about reliability and, um, and the way we did our certification through uh, a system and structure uh, interaction. Well, and then, okay, so yeah. coming from somebody who's been bit by bite before, and for those people out there that uh, don't understand what bit means, that's a piece of built-in test equipment that actually monitors the health of whatever it is and to make sure that it's working properly. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and what you do is you, when it starts up, the first time it sees power, it's going through its own bit. And then the system, if there's a fault in the startup, it'll turn red. Normally, it turn, it's black and, or just goes out. So then the next step to have the pilot interact with that system each flight that's part of the new checklist. In the AFMS that we send out that's certified by the FAA and the AZA, then it includes that three-button push. And if you were in the air and the light comes on, then you do the root memory items, which is pretty much slow down and do a bit, and do another check and see if you can clear the fault. If you can't, then you continue along at the speed prescribed, and then you land and, and see what you can see, see if you can troubleshoot more on the ground. So that requires an installation of an, an, an additional black box in the airplane? Yeah. The system consists of actuators in the wingtips, a brain in the belly, an enunciator box that talks to the, the enunciator button up in the cockpit, and then a, a new tail strobe because we put new strobe lights on and we lost the aft cone. So we put a new tip strobe in on the tail. One more thing for monitoring, Greg, you asked about monitoring. The way yeah. that pilots will be monitoring the performance is they're at 41,000 feet for the first time in a CJ. And they're saying, I can't believe this. I'm at 41,000 feet burning 600 pounds an hour and I have 2,900 pounds of fuel on board. How did this happen? Am I in a dream? So that's how they monitor it. Talk about that fuel efficiency again, because that's, efficiency. that's okay. one of the things that I found very intriguing with these wing tips is the amount of uh, environmental benefits that we get out of these, this installation. Yeah, it's interesting, John, because we haven't even really talked about that because here's what happens. So this CJ is a 900-mile plane, three hours. You want to be on the ground, a straight CJ, CJ1, CJ1+. Plus maybe a little longer than one plus, but you want to be on the ground. Our planes with our winglets are four hour planes. Now we've increased the endurance by almost an hour. We've increased the range like 1,350 miles. No wind is a common place for our customers. We have a hundred customers. Now, a lot of them are straight CJ, CA ones. So the fuel efficiency is incredible. It, it's changing the way these guys are thinking about their planes. It's completely modifying their flight paths, their plans, their city pairs. So it's huge. It, and, but winglets, we've known, we've all been trained for the past 20 years from Southwest Airlines and American Airlines that they get, they're happy with 3%, 3.5% with the APB winglets. They're happy. And then the split scimitar added, you know, a half a percent. They spent another million or whatever it was to get a half a percent. So these guys are so excited for 4%. And what we're doing is we're taking a plane and adding 10, 15, 20%. And because you do that, our credibility is harmed because people don't believe it until they fly it or until they do the math on their own or they have their own aerodynamicist do the calculations. We see this all the time, even with military. We tell them, hey, we can take your plane that's grounded and fly for five and a half hours. And they shake their head and almost kick us out until they do their own math and then they call us back. It really is that weird, John. And you know, the loads that, that you may to neutralize with this system. Mm -hmm. When I first heard about putting this on a Lockheed airplane, those wings are difficult to say the least on that airplane. How are you going to get, mitigate the loads that you're putting on the, on the wing tip that have to travel through that wing when we already have serious problems with the wing? The A models are, were all grounded yeah. because they couldn't keep the wings on the airplane. You know, when I first heard it, I was sort of taken back. I didn't understand the technology, but now that I've seen it, it certainly is different, and it, it is much more understandable now. Well, that's a big thing. The C-130 is huge for us because, you know, every 69 months, they spend $7 million on the rainbow fittings to replace them and to rework them because the fatigue is so bad. When we put our wing extensions and our winglets on a C-130, analytically, we almost double the fatigue life because the stresses are so much lower because it's, it's not the 1G stress. Yeah, the 1G stress may be a little higher, but it's once the system deploys, we actually have on the CJs near the tip, the stresses go down as you pull Gs instead of go up. I mean, it's, it's completely the solution to the C-130 dilemma. It is the solution. It allows us to do life extensions for wing structure because we're not bringing the stress down to what it was before. We're actually bringing it down just slightly below what it was before, which allows us to do the life extension potentially or inspection interval improvements. But also that's how we're doing the, uh, the payload increase on the CJs. 
So we're actually reducing the load below what it was before the modification. And then we can add that extra payload. Yeah, like on the CJ2, we have an 800 pound increase in max zero fuel weight. So all those seats, you can rarely fill them up with a stock CJ, a flat wing CJ, because you hit the max zero fuel weight. A lot of your listeners might know what max zero fuel weight, might not know that what that is, but that is how much the heaviest your fuselage an airplane can be without any fuel in it. And that's a limitation that often the CJ2 guys are hitting. So now we have 800 pounds more in the CJ2. That's four more people that carriers, 135 guys, can put on the plane. If they have the seats, just because they have the seats doesn't mean you can fill them all the time. So now we've, we've unlocked that too with our with the wing tech this technology is so effective at alleviating load it allows us to even increase max zero fuel weight and then takeoff weight we could if we needed to we could increase the takeoff weight because our gradients a lot of times planes are limited to gradients they can't meet the gradients so then the the gross weight is limited there and then it, it just goes on and on think and and this is exciting that an aerodynamic dude or an instructional engineer once he hears about this they immediately their imagination runs free because it allows really efficient aerodynamics to be put on a wing that don't make the stress guy go out of his mind. So it's really exciting. Now turning to the other side of, uh, of the story, given the technology and that kind of stuff, and it's You've been putting it on airplanes, what, for the last three, four years now? I mean, you started uh, uh, installing the winglets on the CJs. Back in November of 2018, there was a, an accident that occurred with a Citation jet, and three three folks uh, were killed in that accident. Of course, Tamrac's name came up because the airplane was equipped with that technology. Uh, there were some supposed in-flight roll events that were caused or at least attributed to the winglet technology. And of course, the investigation of the fatal accident by the National Transportation Safety Board is, is still ongoing. But there was a lot of publicity and of course it had an adverse effect on the fleet, the Citation Jet fleet, because there was still a lot of unknown information and I know that you guys probably can't talk about it because if there's any litigation that comes out of this, you guys are going to be probably named. But from a general sense, there is, just like the 737 MAX, there was a lot of information put out. It was derogatory. It was inflammatory. It pointed to the system on the aircraft when, in fact, the, the investigative process hadn't really fully determined whether or not the, uh, the active winglet technology was a cause or a contributing factor. What can you tell from you know, the information that has been developed with regard to the winglet technology involvement? Because I know that there was one roll event overseas that was really detrimental to Tamarack because of the, the, the statements that were made by a pilot that were exaggerated. Um, it had a real adverse effect on your company and, uh, and the fleet because you had so many operators out there whose airplane really became worthless when it was put on the ground um, unnecessarily. So can you guys just address it from just a brief standpoint, just to give the folks that are out there a sense of what impact it has had, not only on the fleet, but, you know, your company and, and the development of this technology? Yeah. So first thing is Wayne and Andrew, they were friends of ours, right? The, the, the owner of the plane and the pilot. Their customers and our customers are like family. So this was, it was a horrible time for us, right? So first of all, this tragedy occurred. And then immediately after there, yeah, people were throwing mud and it, it was, it got pretty nasty. And because it's an emotional thing, these guys, we love these guys, right? And everybody wants to figure out what happened. And it's hard. It's just like with this Kobe thing, everybody, it's just such an emotional time. So we expect things to be said that, that maybe people regret now, but the whole thing started back in actually a year prior to that. There was a roll event. So we had a, a, in our actuator, a small screw had backed out over the period of this. this our customer had flown it for a year, a couple of years. The screw came out and shorted inside the actuator and caused 
the airplane, one of the devices to hard over. They, they say that in aviation means it goes to a spot and stays. So it's deflected. So the airplane rolls about four degrees per second. Now, of course, we had to do all kinds of certification, millions of dollars and hundreds of hours of flight testing to show that if the plane had a hard over, that it would roll and it was completely easy to control by a normal pilot. So that's where we spent so much of our time and money was doing failure modes and hazard analysis and all that. So we knew that the plane is safe. The guy landed the plane and he called us and said, hey, the plane rolled. We went to look at, look at his airplane, found out the screw, and immediately had a service bulletin. This is a year prior to the incident. And we said, hey, guys, our customers, we want to, um, we have a service bulletin. We found that this roll event happened. At our cost, we're going to change these actuators out, send them in. So that happened in April, May. So we had the service bulletin, recommended service bulletin in May, right, J Jacob? That's right, of, of 2018. 2018. Yeah. Yeah, so we did that service bulletin, rolled it out. You know, we recommended doing it within 100 hours or one year. And, uh, the you know, the plane that crashed uh, in Indiana at the end of November 2018 did have that service bulletin upgrade. Uh, they stayed on top of their maintenance. And we're supporting the NTSB the best we can to figure out what happened there. But then later, April of 2019, there was another roll event that happened in the U.K., no injuries, no damage with that incident. Uh, the pilot landed. Um, he said that the plane had rolled 90 degrees in one second. And so that's where the AD came. Uh, you know, the authorities saw that. They had flown for themselves, simulated failure events. And his report didn't match what we had all seen in certification. This is the very first and only load alleviation in Part 23. We got put through the ringer for good reason in certification. And so this was very well studied in certification, documented, yeah. documented. The ASA flew it for themselves. Of course, we flew it with DERs too. So that part was well understood. And this data came in from this pilot and it didn't match what we had seen in certification. So they said, everybody on the ground while we try to understand what happened. Well, we found out later because we were able to pull the data from the airplane that what he reported wasn't accurate. And also, we found out that that equipment in his airplane hadn't been upgraded with the service bulletin. It was available, you know, 51 weeks before that event. So it was preventable also. So to answer your question, Greg, that did have a detrimental effect on our company and our customers. Uh, we had 91 airplanes on the ground at the time. Uh, most of them had done the upgrades that we had recommended. So we worked with, with the fleet to get everybody upgraded. And as soon as the FAA and EASA reviewed all the facts, uh, including the UK AAIB and, and the NTSB. They reviewed all the facts. They lifted the restrictions on the fleet. So as long as you've done the service bulletins that we'd recommended, everybody's back in the air. So today we have over 100 airplanes flying around. Even during the AD, we were taking orders because it's a good product. People see the benefit. Um, and so we were taking and, orders. And we also knew that the, by that time, we knew that the, the actual events on the, from the flight were 75 degrees and 18 seconds. So nobody knows why the pilot didn't, touch his airplane for 18 seconds. So his airplane rolled four degrees per second for 18 seconds. So it did exactly what it was certified for, but he just ignored the plane. So then it scared him. But so, and our, and our customers knew this and we had already the, the AD to lift the AD or the, to lift the restriction. All you had to do was comply with what we had done up to a year prior. So then we built credibility with our customers and the fleet and the industry because they said, okay, there's no new findings. This was obviously a mistake, and it was so close to 737 MAX issues that we just kind of rolled up, got rolled up into this mess. But you can imagine the impact it's had on our company. You know, our company lot, we had 35 people at one point. We went down to 20 people. We had to lay a lot of people off. But we're, we're, now we're doing installs again, and we're growing. And, and, you know, we did a Chapter 11. We actually did a voluntary Chapter 11 to protect our customers and our, and our company, knowing that this whole thing was a – not I want to say farce. I don't think I should say the word farce, but – uh, but yeah, I did, it, but I just it, said it, it twice. One of those things that, you know, the word of mouth that was unvetted. First off, has anybody really done any aeronautical calculations to see if a citation jet could roll 90 degrees in one second? Hell, military airplanes can't roll that <laughs> fast. I mean, that was so far fetched for a civilian <laughs> citation jet that, I mean, the citations always had a reputation of being the, you know, citation slow jet. But I just find it remarkable that a guy could say that it rolled 90 degrees in one second. I mean, that may have all been in his head. But 
the point being is that like the Max, bad information, misinformation, false information being publicized without being accurately vetted has more than just an immediate detrimental effect on a airplane or or an individual. In this regard, it's not only on your company, but of course on the fleet. And we're seeing that with Boeing and the 737 MAX. And, and I think that with the FAA and the NTSB and the AEIC and EASA, they, as part of their responsibilities, they need to vet this information and control the information before some of them, and I've seen it in the past, and I've been critical of all those organizations for going off half-cocked with information before it's been truly vetted and understood. And uh, they, don't, uh, they don't appear to have any kind of regard for the economic impact. You're, in a, you're a company that's developed technology. You have a customer base out there. And then sometimes to arbitrarily put information out before it's been accurately vetted has a harmful effect. I mean, you know, the United States is going to see that harmful effect of Boeing in, the, in its, you know, gross national product because of the money that's generated by sales of big airplanes like that. So it's good to hear that the company is back on track, but there still resides an issue with at least the FAA and the airworthiness directive that addresses uh, the service bulletins that your company has put out. What's going on and why are they so slow in updating that airworthiness directive um, since EASA apparently was able to do it in a timely manner? What's going on with the FAA? That's a good question. Uh, and just to be clear, the, the fleet is back in the air. The restrictions are lifted using an alternate means of compliance. Uh, which allows everyone to, to keep flying as long as they've done the upgrades. But that AD is still there. Uh, of course, ADs don't really go away, but um, we know there's a, an amendment in process to really make sure that, that the wording in the AD is factual. Some of the wording, you know, we weren't surprised when the AD came out from the FAA, but we were surprised by some of the wording there uh, that, that just isn't accurate. It's not true. And we're not sure why that happened. But we're working with the FAA and, and, like I said, working with NTSB uh, to make sure that they have the facts. And, um, you know, it's important for our customers. It's important for us and important for the process for that to be corrected. Uh, so, that, like you said, like they, that it just can't be put out there. Information can't be put out there that's, that's not factual. Well, it didn't help that we had some bad press that didn't get facts right that were kind of jumping on the bandwagon. But, you know. Matt Thurber from AIN, he put a really good article out that was factual, and it started cha- the and the tide started changing because you know our cu- remember our customers for CJs are all entrepreneurs and you know wealthy men and women, so these guys have had their own fights with whatever business they're in, so they're calling us, giving us pep talks through this whole AD, so very supportive, telling us, hey, the strength of the product, look, I, I can fly my plane overseas now from from gander or goose bay to england this is a great product nick you know do not falter just keep moving and and the strength of the product is going to get you through this so for us you know the the technology and and this the step change not this incremental little growth from you know an old winglet and a little bit better this is so much better that we're going to weather this storm we're going to be on military planes we're going to be on bigger jets more and more, and be, because the, the fuel savings, the environmental impact, the, the carbon emission reduction technology we have is so big, it's going to be able to weather this, this storm and all the politics and whatever whatever's going on that we don't know about. We have the next thing, right? It's like the jet engine or, or – can you imagine buying a, a monitor, a CRT monitor now? It still works, but why would you do that when you could buy a, a flat screen? That's the kind of thing that we have going, and because of our momentum now, Greg, we'll be able to get through this – political stuff that we're seeing. That brings up the, the next question. What's next for the technology? Can it, are, are you continually working to make it better? Is there more improvements that can be made? Or have you, have you topped out with, this is the best product right now, we just are going to in- build it and install it? I mean, can your technology be fine-tuned even more to make it more efficient? Absolutely, Greg. We didn't get into it earlier, but we, we're a technology company. I mean, we have over 30 patents. The technology that's in the product right now is only kind of 
making use of a portion of those patents. And of course, there's always room for improvement in design. Uh, and so we have lots of ideas for the next uh, projects. And beyond that, you know, the system, the concept was designed to be modular in the first place. We're on the full range of Citation jets now, but it was never the intent to only be on those models or even only on business jets. So yeah, absolutely. The technology is applicable to any airplane that could use better climb, more range, and, and less fuel burn. So it's, so it's really applicable in a lot of areas. So for those general aviation pilots, what's the smallest airplane this technology could go on? Now you're talking an economic type discussion. Theoretically, you can go on any, you can go on any plane. Oh, you know what? Somebody's going to win the lottery. They're going to buy a small airplane, and they're going to want the best technology. So well, if I, I have an open, open checkbook, what airplane can I put this on? Well, I had it, you know, when we started the company, my wife and I started the company in 2009, we had it on an RV6. So that was the wow. first product, right? I had to prove that technology worked. The whole thing was, could I get rid of the stresses in the wing during a gust? And once I proved that with margin, I mean, my little RV6, we have pictures of it having an extension and a winglet and the devices on it. It was great. So, yeah, RV6. And we actually did it. We started a certification project on the SR22, the yeah. Cirrus SR22. But then we ran into some economics on that one. So we moved into the business jets. But, yeah, I mean, the technology. The, the plan from the beginning was to, go to, get, to be on an Airbus and a Boeing. But we had to start with something small. So, And then, of course, UAVs, right? We're, we're looking at UAVs and even the ones with winglets. And people keep saying that, well, this plane has winglets. Yeah, I know. You take them off, you put an extension and a bigger wing or a better winglet. So, yeah, the, a lot of the UAVs uh, that are doing ISR that are, you know, 10 years down the road, these planes are timing out. Their wings are getting bent. Their wings are getting timed out. And the payloads keep getting heavier and heavier. And they need to fly higher and higher. So we have the solution for that, too. That's great. Well, it's been a, an enlightening discussion. I know that uh, the technology is definitely well known in the um, citation jet and just the citation community. But I've been exposed to it through the Citation Jet Pilots Association. And, and so I can appreciate, uh, especially from the owners that I've talked to, about the, the performance characteristics and uh, improvements in their respective airplanes. So it's great to hear that uh, I can actually put it on a smaller airplane because as you produce more, that price is going down, isn't it, guys? Yes. Yeah, yes, it's isn't just, it? It's yeah. just like healthcare. The more, the, the, the better the technology, the higher the cost go. Yeah, great. I still get my friends and family discount, don't I? Yes. <laughs> yes, you do. Well, I just want to say thanks for coming in and, uh, and being on the show today. I know that... Uh, you guys have uh, some work to do in D.C. with some other folks around the area, so we won't keep you any longer. But we do appreciate you taking the time out and introducing the audience to TAMRAC and educating those that are familiar with the product to some of the issues and, of course, the, the benefits of the technology. I think that that's what we try to do through this show. And, you know, I think, again, based on some of our earlier discussions, it is word of mouth that can be either beneficial or harmful to a product. And, and again, this is another case where loose lips sink ships without being vetted. And, um, and it did uh, have a bit of an impact on, uh, on you as a company and the fleet. But uh, I'm glad to hear that it's rebounded, that the fleet is up and flying, and that the customers have really realized the safe technology and the benefits to the product. So again, thanks for coming in and, and talking with us and educating the listeners, because I think they're going to now realize that when they look out the window of any airplane, they may see a different type of winglet out there, but they know that it's going to provide not only safety, but uh, added efficiency to that particular airplane, because what everybody wants is, I want to get there now. So they want to go faster. So... Thank right. you, Nick. Right. Thank you, Jacob. Really Thank appreciate you. it. Yeah. John, I'm going to give you Thank the you, last John. word since you're with these two guys, and uh, I'm sitting out here in cloud nine in Tampa. Oh, sure. You're warm and we're wet. Yeah, well, as it should be. All right. Well, thank you, gentlemen, for coming in. Yeah. And we look forward to, to uh, watching you progress and uh, help save the environment on top of making our airplanes more efficient. And uh, with My that, pleasure. I will say thank you. Thank you to our listeners, and 
Fly safe. To listen to more episodes of the show, go to flightsafetydetectives.com or the Professional Aviation Maintenance Association at pama.org and wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Catch us next time when John Golia and Greg Fife talk about all things aviation. Thanks for listening.